your recent work, or more recently, you've you've tried to systematically demonstrate the social effect of imagery, icons, and visualization in IR, which is of course which of course is not uh, necessarily uh, limited to IR. It goes beyond uh, the field. But in respect in respect of political cartooning and other gens of pictorial representation, what role does imagery play in the articulation of identity and security? And perhaps you can just link that. Uh, to the role of political cartooning and security in the Danish context. But the, if I could just sort of kind of, uh, you, you know, just say a little bit about, you know, why I started, moved to study images as well, yeah. uh, um, because that kind of, uh, you know, also answers your question to some extent, or kind of opens up the question about, about the Danish context. Um, that when I worked on the Western, uh, you know, policies and discourses in, on the Bosnian war, I mean, there were, you know, images that had been important, iconic images that had been important, you know, to those debates. Uh, and there was a photo of, you know, a prisoner uh, in, from northern Bosnia uh, that, you know, hit the world news in August of 1992. And he was standing behind sort of barbed wire, uh, emaciated, uh, and so on. So, you know, images were there as part uh, of, 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 of the, of, of the discourses uh, and policy debates over Bosnia, both as a way of providing proof. So, you know, that, it, that, that the photograph had a different epistemic quality than if you just, just quote unquote, had a verbal report about it. So, so there's something here about the way in which the different, you know, different arguments that are made always involve, and this is sort of a Foucauldian inspired point, obviously, always in my, it always involve some kind of epistemic claim, right? So, so and, I, and I think that that's one of the things that's also important about post-structuralism. Uh, and and we, I talked earlier about the politics of representation in terms of, you know, how you represent identities or how you represent a war and so on. But I think the other, Part of post-structuralism of the politics of representation is the epistemic part. You know, how do you create authority? How do you create, you know, a basis from which you can say, you know, this is what, you know, this is this is how we should understand this war, or this is how we should understand migration. Right? So, so, so there is something here about, you know, about the epistemic and images, which I think was important. The other thing that was important about images, and that's even going back again to the to the Bosnian War, was the sort of the possibility of images to invoke emotions that you could just see that would not be the case usually if you had reports that were running through the medium of speech or writing. So you could see sort of one of the things here, the sort of the epistemic and the emotional, uh, I think was already kind of a, it was already, already sort of part of, 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 the, uh, of, of the Bosnian, uh, of the Bosnian engagement. But it wasn't something that was particular. I mean, it's, it's not theorized explicitly in security as practice. Uh, I think in the conclusion, I say something about, you, you know, I say something about, about comics and I say something about, you know, images and so on. Yeah. But, you know, it's a, it's a sort of... But do, you find, do you find much value in, not, not necessarily a move, but, and of course we always use the user term turn from the textual turn to uh, the visual turn. Do you find, for you, is it, is it more of sort of kind of um, a moment in, 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 in IR where there's, there's more discussion around visuals and images and perhaps everyone is kind of moving towards that. Or do you find something really particular, like you've just mentioned, the epistemic and the emotional uh, mm -hmm. value of images? But in that case, um, do we displace textual analysis or how do we incorporate, or how do we, um, say, how do we kind of man, how do we uh, use textual analysis, uh, but also, uh, also hold in those values that visuals and imageries offer as well? Well, I think I think that there. I, I think, like you're saying, I mean, there is one of the reasons why the visual has come in. I think it just in the last five years have got you know a lot more attention in 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 in, in international relations, also in sort of post structuralist, uh, you know, you know, analysis. Um, I just want to say first of all that that you know people like David Campbell uh, in particular, probably you know, did write about visual representations uh, uh, also you, you, you know back. 
uh, in the two in the two thousands. Um, so so I don't think it's been entirely absent, but I think it's you know it's sort of gained ground as a more kind of explicit research agenda. Uh, and you see sort of you know when you see sort of you know books come out called visual security studies and stuff like. And, and you know the visual being included and in, in kind of you, you know methods textbook and so on. It's a sign that you know there's some maturity <laughs> to that line of research. Is it, is it as a result of things happening outside outside IR, or is it you know part of just broadening the research? Uh, well, the I, I think that you, you know you saw in in the humanities from which you know international relations in the sort of more qualitative international relations, uh, I think has sort of you know kind of had, I wouldn't say borrowed has been inspired you know over the years that you saw you know the visual turn uh, as being associated with with Mitchell, a uh, big visual theorist. Uh, from that he coined that term in 1994 and you know before that you had the linguistic term so there is something here about you know inspiration kind of following um, but I think also and and I mean it's always tricky to say that you know we're living in a more visual era uh, uh, than I mean other people have lived in very visual eras you know especially when when people couldn't read or write so i i would be i would be you know hesitant to sort of claim you know kind of on objective historical grounds whether something is more or less visual i do think that you know the way in which that images uh, are being produced and circulating you know beyond kind of traditional, you, you know, news media, um, uh, which used to be the case. I mean, you didn't used to have, you, you know, people having, you, you know, cameras in their cell phones. Uh, you didn't, you know, when I did, did my PhD, the internet was just starting and there was one internet account for the whole department. Uh, so, <laughs> so I am just saying that, that there is something about, especially, especially when you, you know, when you're studying international politics, that the international, pol put, the international, I would say, the international potential of images, I think in the last 15 years uh, have really been heightened. Uh, so, so, so I think that that also has kind of, you know, reinforced the, the kind of, the kind of sort of, I would say sort of sense that the visual is something that is worth, you know, studying. Uh, that, uh, I mean, it's just been a couple of days since uh, there was the, you, you know, the storm on, on Congress uh, in the U.S. Right? And, and, and when you're looking at those pictures, virtually everybody, you know, is recording the event. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, and of course, that's a kind of, you know, maybe that's a kind of particularly striking case, but we're looking at these pictures of people who are involved in something which is a very kind of, you know, dramatic physical action. And yet, you know, it's being, you know, recorded virtually at the same, you know, like at virtually by everybody uh, as things are, as things are happening. So I think that that, you know, that kind of, there's, there's a sort of visual environment and, and, and the changes in terms of the production and circulation uh, and also the, con I would say sort of consumption of images that is also, you know, that has been heightened. So I did some work on the, um, on the, on the photograph of Alan Kurdi, uh, the little four-year-old uh, Syrian Kurdish boy who drowned in September of, of 2015. And, and there you would see how people would be engaging, you know, with, with the image on social media, you, you know, making their own drawings, you, you know, mirrored on the original photo, uh, you, you know, reenacting the photo, uh, for example, you, you know, by building uh, some, what what it call when you you big sort of you built sand sculptures you know uh, uh, taking photos of that you know and circulating that so you, you know twenty years ago that just wasn't that possibility of doing that in real time right so 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 I think that that also and and I think that that sort of you know also asked questions as to you know. You, you, you raised a question about sovereignty, you, you know, in your opening statements, I mean, you, you, you know, to sort of theorize that also actually in the relation of kind of the big questions in IR, you know, what is sovereignty, you know, who, who, who are, you know, who, who are the kind of agents and actors and all of that. So I think that, that, that there's a larger kind of, you know, constellation of questions uh, that the visual uh, is part of uh, as well. I guess, I guess some, uh, I guess my, um, some of my worry with the visual turn or perhaps using that language then 
uh, it sort of it runs the risk of perhaps maybe creating a false binary between the visual and the linguistic, right? So, uh, just like you said, just bearing that in mind, right? The visual is not necessarily something new that just you know, uh, just came up, right? It's been there. You mentioned uh, David Campbell as well was written on that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But just bearing that in mind, so we don't run that risk of creating uh, those false divisions, right? Uh, yes, uh, if you want to. If you want to go ahead and perhaps talk about uh, political cartooning and security in the Danish context. Well, I mean, I, I just want to say that I absolutely, you know, that I absolutely agree. And and that I think the visual turn for me, and then that's maybe that's also, you know, I'm trying to always remain a post-structuralist, <laughs> is, is that, you know, we don't want to bring the visual in in order to stabilize the word. Right. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, one of the kind of main things I think you learn when you're doing post-structuralist discourse analysis is to actually look for the impossibility of ever having a completely stable language. Right? So, so you, you know, part of the analysis is to find ways to deconstruct, to you know, understand slippages and 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 all of that things about language. So, you know, by coming in and saying, oh, you know, the visual is it's so ambiguous, it's so unstable, it's so difficult, you know, then, you know, you don't want to say it's like, oh yeah, but uh, you know, words are really stable. So <laughs> I think this is a, the theoretical and the methodological challenge is, I think, at the same time, I think there is something worth theorizing about the way in which the visual representations, you know, constitute meaning that I think at least for the parts of the world that I'm a part of, that, you know, are different. But that difference shouldn't be theorized in such a way that we then come to, you know, understand, you know, the kind of worldly language as being, you know, stable and problematic and so on. So, which means also that I think the relationship between the two, you know, also has to be key. Um, so, so I think, and that's all that can sort of move in, 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 in to look at, you know, the political cartooning and the Muhammad cartoons, uh, I think is a, is a very, you know, very good illustration of that. And, in, you know, the Muhammad cartoons was a sort of visual push that uh, finally made me, you know, ask questions about, uh, about the visuals, you know, the Muhammad cartoon, the first Muhammad cartoons were published by the Danish newspaper Jyllandsposten, and a large part of the first rounds of debate were in Danish, and so on. So there was also something here about being able, you know, to you know get the kind of local uh, Danish language, you know, you know, side of things into analysis that that kind of made me, you know, work on that uh, for a while. But I think also, and and that that was sort of something that sort of arose out of analysis of. You know, particularly the cartoon by Kurt Vestergaard, who came, which came to sort of, you know, become the iconic one of the twelve original ones that were, you know, that were printed, is the sort of the inherent ambiguity in terms of what that drawing signifies. Right. And uh, and I think that that sort of is one of the I think that's one of the key kind of theoretical, you know, insights into the relationship between, you know, discourse and, you know, visual representation is that, you, you know, you can ha have collective, you know, you can talk about collective identities or collective subjects in discourse, you know, so we could talk about, you know, the Islamic, we can talk about the terrorist, we can talk about Muslims, uh, for example, yeah. we could talk about, you know, the religious subject. But if you're looking at, you know, a singular, you know, visual representation, you know, it cannot in and of itself, you know, articulate what collective, you know, identity or what, you know, what, what subject that it is a representative of. Yeah. So, so this means that there is a different kind of interpretive gap between the visual representation and discourse. Okay. And, and, and I think that that's one of the things that has been important also in terms of understanding, you know, specifically if we're taking, you know, you know, that cartoon as a case in point, is that you have now more than 15 years later, you still have competing, you know, kind of articulations of what that cartoon signifies, you know, whether it is an attack on, you know, on, 
you know, Islam as a religion, whether it is, uh, you know, a critical satirical rendition that critiques those that are taking using religion, you know, for their own self-serving purposes, you know, whether it is an articulation in defense of free speech and so on. So, and I think for me as an, you know, as a theor you know, as a theoretically engaged person, I think it has been central to maintain that I think my analytical role is to give an understanding of how that ambiguity continues to be possible. Okay? It's not to say, you know, I mean, it, I don't think that 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 I don't think that my analytical role is to come out and say, you know, with certainty what that cartoon signifies, okay? because I think that that is actually theoretically impossible. So, so, so this means that, that, that for me, and, that, and that's also, you know, in coming saying why I think actually that, you know, that discourse is so incredibly important because discourse is part of constituting the political significance of this drawing. Right. Okay. So, so, so you, you, you know, I think we can only understand the politics of that image through understanding the articulations that can be made, compete, uh, accepted by some, rejected by others. Right? Um, so, so in, in, you know, there would be other cases, you know, like the Alan Curdy image that had much more, you know, there was much more kind of uniformity in terms of how that cartoon was constituted, you know, as something that shows an incredible loss of life, you know, the need for things, you know, for somebody to do those the EU, heads of states and so on to do something. Um, but you could also say that still, you know, that there were, you know, discourses that were ascribing significance to this image and also to provide a particular, you know, connecting, you know, between, you know, that dead boy and a larger, you know, migrating subject, you know, a larger European Union, for example, which had failed and so on. So in that sense, there is, you know, there is a connectingness going on between, you know, those, between those images and, 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 and uh, you know, discourse and therefore also the politics that, uh, that should, you know, that are said to be following from a given image. Right. I guess the, as a theorist, uh, your work would be identifying those, um, those instabilities and actually showing uh, politics around that because it does get to a point sometimes it seems as if the discourse around a particular uh, image does settle mm -hmm. and stabilize at least for setting groups or setting communities yeah. but yeah I guess that's where the work of the structure is coming to actually show how unstable it really is. Yeah. Well, and, and also, and also, I think, you know, you're absolutely right, but also to provide the other kind of side of the coin, which is to say, you know, if we're looking to the, if we're looking to, you know, both the Ulan's Person cartoons, but also the, the ones that have been published by Charlie Hebdo and so on, is to say that there would also, there could also be certain, you know, constitutions of an image that then come to stabilize, right? So, so in that sense, you know, if I'm looking to the Danish to the Danish context, uh, if I'm to sort of take my post-structuralist, you know, theory and and then also to you know give advice to you know media politicians and 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 others who are more practically involved, you know, with 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 politics, you know, on these issues migration, for example, or, you know, Danish Muslim relations and so on. And, and, and is to, to say, you also have to acknowledge that there is a discourse that are constituting these cartoons as, you know, an attack on the Muslim, on the Islamic and so on. So, so you also, you have to engage with those, you know, you have to engage with those representations as well. So mm -hmm also to say that that you know I think when you're working post-structurally with images th th what they signify can change over time mm -hmm. and 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 in in, in in precisely because discourses play a role in terms of you, you know constituting them as you know signifiers you know onto something you know signifiers of something uh, uh, that is larger than what is depicted within you know the image itself. All right, interesting. Uh, I guess the next question is, is more of a personal, uh, more of a personal question, uh, which I've, I've, I've sort of come to 
you know, to think about myself when writing up my PhD. Uh, using post-structural approaches, how, how should we approach the status of, of sovereignty in the present day? Paying attention to the specific, specificity of particular trajectory of state sovereignty, especially in non-Western uh, societies. Mm -hmm. uh, my PhD is currently in uh, state counter-terrorism strategy in Nigeria. And this, the question of sovereignty always comes up when you're dealing with the state, but there seem to be or perhaps if you can if you can tell us how how can we how can we grapple with the challenges of state sovereignty in non-western societies uh, using the structural approach hmm. well i guess first of all i want to say that i have not worked much with with non-western societies so you would have to <laughs> you you know i'm curious to hear what 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 you think about about this um i think that I think that it is important probably to go back to 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 some of the first post-structuralist writings, you know, because when, when we're talking about sovereignty, I'm always sort of reminded of RBJ Walker's analysis uh, of the, you know, the principle of state sovereignty. And, and I think one of the things that stood out there was both that there was a historical analysis to it. So, you know, so state sovereignty has not always uh, been the organizing political principle, uh, you know, of, uh, of, of the modern that it is in, in, in parts of the modern world. But also I think that what RBJ Walker's work was stressing was that sovereignty was not so much a, an empirical condition as it was a question. Right. So, so you, you know, Inside Outside, the name of his book from 93 that collects, you know, a big part of his, uh, of his writing from the 80s and early 90s. I think it's a sort of that, that, that sovereignty is a question that you know articulates political communities and and you, you know provides a resolution to some of the big dichotomies in political life you know between uh, you know between the universal and the particular between what is inside and what's outside between you know in time you, 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 you know what is you, you, you know what can't be changed and what can and so on so i think that that in that sense um there's both the question of, you know, empirically what happens, you know, with, you know, sovereignty, you know, what can states do? But there's also the question of, you know, how do we think about those questions about around political community? Um, and, and I think for me, a sort of a post-structuralist, you know, engagement with, with sovereignty involves both. Uh, now, just coming to coming back to the post-structural politics working group, um, what emerging events, debates, or discussions in international politics, in your view, do you think that this working group and post-structural approaches more generally uh, can contribute to? Well, I think that there are a number. I, I mean, I think there are a number of things. I think actually, what you're asking about, you know, sovereignty and the non-Western world. I mean, I, th I think that there is a question. Um, I think there is a question in terms of, you know, how universal a theory can we have? <laughs> and, and I mean, post-structuralist IR is a theory about, you know, how claims about the universal are always, you know, always have to be in relation to something that is particular. I mean, that was sort of, you, you know, RPJ Walker's, you know, one of his sort of key points in terms of, you know, claims about, you know, universal status of something, for example, human rights will always be, you know, differentiated from, you know, countries that don't comply with human rights or that some that are particularly, you know, positioned to define the universal, right? So in that sense, you know, the true universal does not exist. Right. It's always it's, so. So if that if we're taking that with us, the post-structuralism is also a theory that would always ask us to question and deconstruct claims about the universal, uh, other than parts of post-structuralist theory that is itself actually universal. Right? <laughs> and and I think in that sense, that sort of comes back to to what extent you know is there you, you know are there are there kind of is there a universality that has to be rethought if you know if post structuralism as it has developed in international relations over the last you know 30 uh, 30 years if that is going to be better for example like you're saying to understand you, you know the contestations and 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 you know also you know invocations of sovereignty in a place like nigeria um uh, so I think in that sense, there is also, you know, you, you, you know, important questions, 
uh, or sorry, sort of, you know, interfaces between post-structuralism uh, and those who are working on, you know, post-coloniality and coloniality and, 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 and also critical race studies and all that. Um, I think that there is, but I mean, that's my own, kind of what I've been working on for the last couple of, of, of years that you're saying. I think that there is, you know, still a lot more to do about the visual. And, and I think also, uh, also to sort of the theorization of the relationship between, you know, visuals and discourse of, and emotions. So, you know, emotion ha has been one of the kind of thing, sort of key, you know, questions on, on kind of, you know, critical international relations and also more conventional post, conventional constructivist work, you know, for the past decade. And, and one of the things, you, you know, that's often said about emotion, or, or sorry, about images is that they have a particular capacity, you know, to invoke emotions. Um, and I think from a post-structuralist perspective, I think it's important to also, you know, engage with the, with emotions and claim about emotions in a way where they become part uh, of the collective and part of the discursive and part of, you know, engagements with the, between people. So this isn't to say that you can't study emotions as, you know, individual psychological, uh, in, in, you know, I wouldn't say things, but at, at the level of individual individuals in psychology. But for me, as coming out of a post-structuralist, you know, politics of representation tradition, my sort of concern is with the way in which the emotions are being constituted between people and how they sort of, you know, how they then also become, you know, epistemic claims almost, right? So you can say, you know, because this is what an image makes me feel. This is then also how I feel we should response, you know, we should respond to it. Right. So both the Alan Kurdi image and the Muhammad cartoons have had very emotional discourses around them, right? And, uh, and in that sense, you know, the mobilization of emotions can then actually also be, you know, something that gives, you know, authority to a discourse. So in that sense, it's, again, it's the study, the study of, of the epistemic and, and the emotional, I think, is, is important. Um, I think here also that... Um, uh, that that, uh, that is also important here to then sort of think the emotional also in terms of visuals where maybe, you know, maybe one need, but by one I also mean myself to kind of do more, to integrate what I would call visual practices. Right. So, so if you if you look, take the example of Alan Kurdi and people who are creating, you know, their own images of Alan Kurdi, and, and then you know putting those on social media. Okay. So, you know, that's clearly an utterance, and something is being done. Right? But there might not be any text. Right? So, this means also that we need to situate, you know, those kind of, you know, to understand kind of the, those as kind of I would say sort of political articulations. Um, and, 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 and I think visual practices is currently the, the sort of the term that, that kind of makes uh, uh, some, some sense uh, of this, at least uh, to me. That really sounds interesting, visual practices, right? It's uh, something that, I mean, I also engage in it, right? You put a particular uh, uh, or, you know, you know that is actually doing something, right? And uh, yeah, I think that. Yeah. So, so this, so I think also, and I actually, I, I actually wrote a, a, a chapter in a book edited by Emmanuel Adler and Vincent Perio in, in 2011 called International Practices, uh, where they were sort of inviting people who weren't part of the kind of, you know, practice, practice turn uh, to think about, you, you know, what taking on a more practice approach, you know, would entail. Um, so I was writing there about, you know, cartooning as a practice. Um, uh, so, 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 but I think, I think you know, sort of more could be kind of, it, more could be done around that too. I will also say that I think that, you, you know, that the class, I wouldn't, I would always say classical politics of representation, you know, still continues to be really important. And, you know, we're talking about, I mean, again, I was sort of been following, like, I think probably, you know, a lot of people have been following, you know, the coverage and the political responses to, you know, to, to what happened uh, in Washington. And, and, you know, is it a classical discursive politics of representation? You can see the sort of the articulation of a discourse that, you know, that those who were entering the Capitol were patriots, you know, so you have that patriotic discourse. Then you have the counter discourse that it was terrorism. 
<laughs> right. And of course, there's that patriotic uh, discourse that's also produced, uh, or, or the people entering capital is also that as this discourse that produces them in relation to, of course, the Black Lives Matter protest yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 All of that coming up. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I mean, and, and, and that's the sort of where, you know, I, I'm not an expert on American politics, but I, I think that, you know, a dichotomous positioning of, let's say, you know, patriots and terrorists, I think might actually close down the possibility for having, you know, political discourses and engagements that are better, you know, equipped to making things better. I mean, this is almost the kind of sounding, you know, ending on a more sort of peace research note, you know, which is where I started in 1990 <laughs> with, you know, how to find a way to, you know, critique a dichotomous constitution of, you know, of, of the evil empire in the Soviet Union and, you know, the beacon of light in the, in the US, you know, so that's kind of where, you know, early post-structuralism was about engaging with those dichotomies. And I, and I think, you know, there, there, you know, Quite a number of instances where we would still see those dichotomies, you know, you know, being articulated in in political discourse, and and I think that that sort of, I think we always need to, to then ask us what that might do in terms of simplifying a political space, right? So so it's less about whether those whether those representations are correct or not, but what they do politically. Right. All right, uh, that has been it's been lovely uh, speaking to you. Um, so much, so much to think about. Uh, thank you, thank you for your time. Um, yeah, and this brings us to the end of today's uh, interview with Professor Lena Hansen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye.